Yeah, sure. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, thank you. So again, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, I'm Ashwat. I'm going to be your host and moderator for today's conversation. I work with the Firki team at Teach for India. Uh, I've been with Teach for India for the last eight years. Uh, uh, the main purpose of this space is uh, to step back, think about our leadership journey, learn from others. And uh, particularly, I'm excited about this space because uh, it's with Ronnie, who's extremely dynamic and, uh, according to me, an ace of many trades. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to let you know that please uh, use the chat window to share in your comments, responses, uh, where you're joining from and use the Q&A section to post questions that you have, which I'll then curate and ask them towards the end of the discussion. Um, but yeah, let me get started to try to introduce him. I'm going to be Chris, but I'll also try to do justice to the several achievements he has. So I think you should uh, be Chris. Ronnie... You'll do best justice if you're Chris. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's really difficult given, you know, the set of achievements, but I'm going to try. So Ronnie Skuwala is the first generation entrepreneur. Uh, he's pioneered cable TV in India. He's also built one of the largest toothbrush manufacturing operations. Uh, and then he went on to create, create the media and enter, entertainment conglomerate called UTV, uh, which uh, has spanned television, broadcasting, digital, mobile, and motion pictures, and eventually de divested that to the Walt Disney Company in 2012. Uh, and I'm sure if uh, if any of you think about your top five Hindi movies growing up, one of it definitely will be under this banner. Um, apart from this, uh, uh, he's demonstrated an innate ability to even merge creativity with commerce. Uh, Newsweek termed, termed him the Jack Warner of India. Esquire rated him as one of the 75 most influential people of the 21st century and Fortune as Asia's 25 most powerful. Uh, in his second innings, that is for in from 2013, Ronnie is driven by his interest in championing entrepreneurship, has authored a book on entrepreneurship titled Dreams With Your Eyes Open. It's also focused to build his next set of ground up businesses in high growth and impact sector, uh, sectors, which include Upgrad, U-Sport, and I'll get him to talk about that a little later. Uh, he's also passionate about social welfare and is active along with his wife, Zarina, as a founder trustee of the Swadesh Foundation. Uh, and they work uh, with a single-minded focus of empowering one million lives in rural India across different verticals from nutrition, sanitation, health, uh, and a different set of things. So um, with no further delay, let's get started with our ace of many trades. Uh, so Ronnie, uh, I want to actually get started, if it's okay with you, with your book, Dream With Your Eyes Open an entrepreneurial journey. And this book has been tagged that almost every entrepreneur or wannabe entrepreneur in India should read. Uh, so I just want to start the conversation on this note. Uh, would like to hear from you on what has been your entrepreneurial journey? Uh, what are things that you've done differently? What have you learned in the last three decades? You know, the book I, I wrote for two reasons. One was that I was extremely clear that I needed to, um, the in India, we don't talk about failures. And I think we wanted, I wanted to talk more about failures and success because normally people write books when everyone thinks they've arrived. But everyone therefore thinks that only some people arrive, whereas actually there's a lot of struggle that goes beyond that and behind that. And it goes with a lot more failures. I would say my, uh, my odds and ratios of failures versus successes, about eight failures and two successes. That's the ratio. Now, for most people, they think, now, wait a minute, how does that tally? because you should have at least had six successes and four failures to be around to have this conversation. Um, so I think the, what I'm trying to say is when I have a failure, it's as good as what it was. But when there's a success, because I've learned from my failures, my successes tend to be 10x, 20x, and 30x. So I rate every failure as 1x, meaning as good as that failure is. I risk something, 10 hours of time, something else, an investment, whatever else, if that fails, that's one X. But those eight X of failures show me how to succeed in a very different manner. And each of those successes, if they were 10 or 20 X, then I got a 30 X on this side and a minus eight on X. And I think each of us have to figure out in our lives, what does that mean? Um, so one was about the fact that you mostly learn from failures. I've never, I, I can't remember a single learning that I've had, which is from successes. Okay, successes are just enough for you to sort of think, you know, celebrate for that evening and then move on. 
so that's one of the motivations for my reading, uh, writing the book. I think towards my key learnings over the last uh, 20 years and more, I think one of the things that most people don't do is stay the course. Okay. And I think people think, um, as you said, they, I wear multiple hats. Now that is because I get a challenge with that. But if I look at it, I spent the better part of my first life, uh, first innings of my life, really building something in media and entertainment because I loved it. I've decided and I wanted to do scale. So I think one of the learnings for me very clearly has been just stick and stay with it, which also means that not to have a plan B. Now, when you make a strategy and you make a plan, you always do make some plan Bs. So I'm not saying plan B is such a bad idea, but it's more a, a, a business management grad school exercise. In real life, I've really felt that I've gone through my failures better when I've only had a plan A, because then you don't look at that. My very existence, I would say, of becoming an entrepreneur, when I, come, I came from a lower middle class home, uh, my dad, my brother, both highly much more educated, all professionals. So for somebody to step on and want to do an entrepreneur was a high risk in the first place. And I think my parents told me at that stage, you know, why don't you, why don't you study a bit? Why are you, after BCom starting on this, why don't you do your CA or an MBA? Worst case situation is if you, after you don't, if you fail to be an entrepreneur, at least you can go to have a job. But if you don't get even a degree, then even if you don't feel an entrepreneurship, you nobody give you a job. And to me, that saw me through more, which means that no, I didn't want to have that parachute. Because the chances are, if I'd done my MBA, or if I'd done my CA at that particular point in time, then my first three times I failed, and I failed many more times after that, I would have maybe said, maybe I'm not cut out to be an entrepreneur, DNA, and then gone and taken a job, and life would have been very different. Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, we already have a question from Neetal, uh, which is how do you motivate yourself to come out of these failures? And while you share that, um, I also want to make an observation. It's really amazing to see how you've dev cultivated this um, uh, attitude towards failures and almost used it to springboard your success. It is a springboard. It is a very yeah. important springboard. And look, you could springboard from a failure to a failure. Don't get disheartened by that. How do yeah. I motivate myself? I think it is really my own self-conviction. At the end of the day, I think a lot of the time we live our lives for what other people think about us. And it's a real waste of time. And it's human. And to some extent, it happens. You know, somebody says something or five people say uh, an opinion, you feel affect you're affected by that. But I think if you really feel you want to be self-motivated, you need to be self-convinced that I'm my best critic, but I'm also very clear that I know what I can do and what I can't do. And I have the best self-confidence and self-conviction myself. If you have your own best conviction at yourself, nobody can shake your confidence. They can give you a bad day. You know, they can make you feel lousy. They can, you can may feel low for one or two days, but they won't shake your motivation and your confidence. Can anyone really motivate you no, I don't think so. Of course, when you do something nice and your boss comes in and says, let's inspire, but it's all temporary. If you ask me, that's not the foundation of real motivation. If you can turn on your own engine for your own self-motivation, that's 10 times more valuable because the timing of getting motivated to the time you're unmotivated may not click unless it's your own where you're turning internally and have that reservoir of your own self-conviction. And that's not easy to build, but it's the most important thing to build. Thanks for sharing that. Um, just uh, related to that, right? Uh, there's so much entrepreneurial spirit uh, and an attitude that you're talking about. I just want to understand like, what factors have really enabled and cultivated this? Uh, even this uh, piece which you just told about, how do you motivate yourself? Like, Are there certain practices? Was there a certain... Uh, defining moment where you were able to make the switch, what factors really contributed to how you think? I think, I think, I don't think there was a, there was a shift. It was, I was pretty from a very, I was pretty clear from a very young age about two things that I, I, I didn't want to necessarily work for somebody else. And I felt um, that I'm not the best person to execute somebody else's vision. And I think those were my two driving elements for me to be able to do what I wanted to do. And we very stay the course and want to do that and just stay with that. And that's pretty much where it landed. And that was at a very early age. The fact that I couldn't implement somebody else's vision drove me to saying, I want to start something my own. That decision came first. 
then what was that idea came much later for a lot of people they feel I've, until i have a great idea i'm not sure i'll, I'll flip or until i have funding i won't flip those to me are very weak arguments because the real key thing was once i was convinced that i just wanted to do something on my own that was the one that got me going got it thank you so much for sharing that uh, we have one question and if you're okay responding to it is there a failure story that you can share that has actually motivated you and it kind of still stays with you yeah there are tons of them there are tons of them till today there were tons of them to, yeah, you know i mean when i started um, cable tv which was one of the first things i started for the full first year i couldn't land one single customer i knocked on people's doors and i got the door banged on me but i learned the importance of understanding the consumer i learned the importance of again saying 6 months into the job people told us are you sure this is the, maybe the you're too early for the idea and i said no i want to stay with it uh you know many years later when we started up on utv i think there were at least three times when i couldn't pay salaries in that month and that's the time when you test the, the maximum with your people pull them all together give them the confidence that this is momentarily and the moment will pass even when we started our movies division our first five movies were super flops most other people would have run away by saying this is not for me it's only for a few uh chopras and johars and khans um but to me i was very clear that if i wanted to build a brand in media i needed to be part of the big screen outside of the broadcast channels whatever so i had to stay with it um we started home shopping and home shopping as a channel long back that didn't work i stayed with it for 2 years and then i shut it down because i really felt it was too early in this time maybe if i had stayed the course with that one we would have been bigger than flipkart today because we started that e-commerce way before anyone else did but it was on a it was television physical delivery and physical swapping of cards so tons tons and tons of failure stories thank you for so graciously sharing so many stories uh uh what we can do uh, what what i'd like for us to do is to see if we can spend more time talking about you know the different uh, ventures you've started and through that also kind of unpacking your journey uh so if if you don't mind can we get started or, or talk about the swadesh foundation uh just would like to understand the work there what's been your involvement uh, uh what is the yeah. so i think you know when we were just about starting i think i was in my, i was in my early 20s when we started what was at that time called share society to heal aid restore and educate is what it stood for then later it we just renamed it swadesh only in 2013 so share for us we started pretty much in 1990 was and at a very early stage and the reason i say this is for a lot of people today everyone feels no i need to have arrived i need to be of a certain age and i need to have a bank balance to be able to give back it didn't come that way i was quite clear that 10% of whatever we'd make we we'd give back and at that stage we weren't making much because i was as i said i started a business with 37500 rupees and that's the maximum i put in the com um, company from day one so when we took our first office of 10000 square feet in andheri i put 1000 because i said 10% i gave 1000 to at that time we started a crash an old age home um and people came in in the day you know but at the first 30 people in our staff got so involved that they started owning that even more than i did and it formed the culture of even our company because then everyone was there you're on the lunch break people would come early to work we would stay late from work to be able to look at that uh then the first employee we had in our not for profit came from the raigad district and she told us one fine day that let's go to the raigad district because there's a huge problem on water is the deccan plateau it's the konkan belt you know water for 4 or 5 months is just terrible and people people walk 8 miles 10 miles for that and we took a drive and we came back and we said okay we need to do something in rural india so we phased up in a very small way we worked with i think about 39 villages or something at that stage which is still big but for us given what we're doing now at that time it looked pretty small and that's pretty much how it happened and that's was active but at least during those years we stayed there and in 2012 when we sold utv to disney is about the time when both zarina and i kind of looked and said what do we do with our not for profit and i want to tell you so she went and did the teach for india course for, in pune for 10 days okay uh, and she really loved it she really loved it she came back excited after this 10 day uh, tfi course and said i'm going to join teach for india 
So I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. We have this foundation that we have. She said, yeah, yeah, but we're doing some stuff. No, this is the real thing. So I said, no, 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 no. You can't join Teach for India. Um, why don't we lift a million people out of poverty every five years? So she said, are you serious about this? Or you're just kind of trying to hold me back from taking this job. So I said, no, no, I think we, I, you know, I'm part serious, but I think we can make it work. And that's pretty much how the idea came to get to the next level. Now, having said that, and sometimes as an entrepreneur, I, I can only tell you that's exactly how it works. Sometimes when you say it, and then you have to live up to it, that's how vision statements are formed. Vision statements are not formed when you wake up in the middle of the night or wake up in the morning and say that. And then we spent the next one year researching a lot of people and a lot of NGOs across India. And we found that people are doing incredible amount of work, fantastic work, but they were either in silos, which is good, either in education or health or something else, whatever the case may be. Uh, and uh, they were either working in silos and I felt they were doing this for the last 10 years, 15 years. And my main question to most people is what's your impact? Like if you've been doing this for such a long period of time, there should be some impact. And there was, but not measurable. So at the end of that one year of research, I felt I was very clear. We wanted to run an execution foundation, which means we wanted to roll up our sleeves and be part of it, build our own team, not just cut a check. And therefore we could have nimbleness and do that. Second, we wanted to do something at scale. So that's why, you know, the million people and, Third is we want to take a concentric geography and look at everything. Because the one thing we realize is that if you just do education or just do water or just do sanitation, it doesn't solve the problem. Because if I do education, but if I haven't solved the water problem, the girl child is not coming to school, X, Y, Z, A, B, and you know this, and you're all working in the not-for-profit sector. So you know that also. Um, so that was the third thing, the holistic 360 degree approach to what we wanted to do. And that's pretty much how we embarked on it. And then that's what we've done. We've built an organization. We have 300 fabulous people working in a not-for-profit. Uh, we bring our entrepreneurial skills. We are very involved. Zaina spends all her time on Swades. I spend at least 30% of my time on Swades. And it's been incredible. And I think, you know, in the last five months, just when we thought we had figured things out, we had, you know, 30% of our households in that uh, 120,000 households that we have, they, we worked there with 1,200 schools and 800 Anganwanis in our geography. So that's a, that's a huge footprint amongst working with the households. And 30% of our households are closed households. And in the last five months, 95,000 people have come back. A reverse migration has happened. And for the last four years, we used to sit in Bombay and give lectures to all our people who were coming from Raigad saying, why don't you reverse migrate? Because... You, do you really like the life in Bombay? You're earning 12,000 rupees. You're, 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 you're sleeping on a bunk bed above somebody else. You're spending 10,000 of those 12,000 and 1,000 you're sending back home to your village. And we, the insight we got from everyone was, you know, I've come here from the village. I can't go back because it'll, I'll be viewed as a failure. So it was a psychological thing for them to reverse migrate. And I think COVID just suddenly woke them up and said, we're rushing back. You know, and I think... It's a, it's a huge challenge for India because we have the rural and we have urban India, but nobody ever figured that there was this 80, 90, 100 million people that were in between, that were not rural nor urban, but were living in that kind of situation. So that's been a revelation for us and it's a learning every single day. So it's wonderful to hear this. Uh, I mean, there's almost every sector you guys, you all are working with, with water, sanitation, health, agriculture, education, uh, would definitely request the participants to go see the site and see the kind of work they're doing. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a big site. We work across <laughs> 1,500 square kilometers. So it's a big site. It's not one site. But yeah, we work with about 2,200 villages. Yes. Yeah. But as you were sharing, Roddy, one question that came to my mind is, as you venture into this and the kind of diverse uh, operations you're taking in through this foundation, you're not also unpacking the complexity it takes to, you know, sometimes solve this. So just wanted to understand how do you approach complexity? Um, uh, how do you keep yourself motivated? How, how do you kind of, you know, deal with situations which are sometimes... Yeah, it is a bit of a thankless approach because to me, as I keep telling my 300 people and myself also, and Zarina, that, and, uh, that the, day when, the day when they say, Tata goodbye. And the day they say, what? We did all this. You're saying you all did it? Is the best we'll get out of it. Because that really means that we've handed over and they're in control of their own destiny. One of the, so that's, that's what I think is, is going to be. But I, mean, I won't say it's a thankless job, but it's a job where you need to have low expectations. One of the things that I think we did 
okay in the beginning, but it was a big learning for us, uh, was the fact that because we were an execution foundation and because we're entrepreneurs, you know, we want to thump the table, get on with life, let's grow, let's do this, let's set targets, 25,000 toilets in three years, let's build this, you know, a tap in each home, each of the schools, we want to set 1,200 libraries, one in each school, we want to teach career counseling. The parents didn't understand what career counseling was. If I, if I have a question of career counseling with the kids and they go back and the kids, and the, I talk to the parents and the parents have never asked, because nobody asked them, what do you want to do when you grow up? Okay, and now the kids are coming home and ask them. So I was told today that outside being a teacher or a fireman or joining the government or being a policeman, there's this opportunity and they, they would be a little dumbfounded. So they would feel insecure about the fact that now my kid is asking me career counseling questions that I don't know anything about. But I think what we realized was that we were pushing our targets onto the community. Whereas actually the, the, in the not-for-profit space, we need to understand what their expectations were. So then we slowed down from a push to a pull impact of everything we wanted to do and then formed our village development committees. Now the village development committees then tell us they've mapped it and they come back and say, these are our deficiencies. This is what we want to do. Then the buy-in is even 3X and 4X. So then the push became the pull. And that was a whole metamorphosis that happened in the foundation while we were still working at a good pace in a very focused manner with everyone. Thanks for sharing that. Uh... I also like if you could just give us a quick overview of your other ventures that you founded, which is U Sports, RSVP. So I think today, if you look at it, in my second innings, in my second innings after I moved out of media and entertainment, for me, uh, my mainstay of building what I built with UTV for the last 15 years before that is with uh, in our ed tech company, Upgrad, which is in the higher education space, from college degrees to whatever else, 100% online, 100% uh, ed tech. Um, for ages after everything above K-12. So from college all the way to 58, we believe lifelong learning is important. We believe that many people have gotten into jobs at a very early stage and are now finding themselves irrelevant and they need to upgrade themselves every three to four years. They're not gonna be able to get out of a job. So they'll have to do it while they're on job and online will solve the problem. But online is not about one video camera and having a Zoom lecture. Online is a whole learning experience which we've perfected over the last four years. And because of, I think, the pandemic, it's even getting more attention. So that's really my main focus. Uh, Swades is my main not-for-profits focus. And that's pretty much where I'm at. And my two passion projects, I would say, is that I think storytelling was always there in the back of my mind. I think I would be a little restless if I wasn't, if my creative juices were not finding themselves outflow. So at the end of five years, after I'd sold the media company, I had a non-compete with Disney for five years. At the end of five years, I decided maybe I should do some more storytelling. So purely as a passion. And purely as a hobby, it started RSVP to do movies. I mean, the good part about it being a hobby uh, is that when it's a business, 60 to 70% of the time you do what you have to do and 30% of it becomes what you want to do. And when you have a hobby, 100% of the time is what you want to do. So I can say a lot more no's than yeses. Um, so between that and sports, those are passion projects for me. So that's pretty much rounds up what I'm doing. Thanks for sharing that. So if I had to ask you, how is producing a movie different from starting a company like an ed tech company? Well, the common factor for both is storytelling. You know, actually, you know, you're, you, you're run that and you should know. When you're, where is the class where you get the raptor's attention? You know, when you can tell a story. And that doesn't mean a fictional story. It's a story where the tone, how you speak, the way you get the attention of the people. But at the end of the day, we're all storytellers. You take a math solution, you take a biology solution, or you take an English language solution. But if you can say it in a story, they'll go back remembering that story. So to me, the commonality between anything to do with media and education is storytelling. And is there any differences? Oh yeah, there are plenty of differences. I mean, I think there are. I mean, I think, you know, there's a lot of gravitas in education. Uh, yeah. When you're looking at you're, when you're looking at the at consumer trends in entertainment and media, it's a different mind space that you're catering to, which has different tense. Education for most people is looked as a very gravitas situation. It's an event. Now, Abgrad, the first thing I'm, we're trying to do is take out the fact that education is no longer an event. An event meaning you go to school, then you go to college. It's set. Your pattern is set. Now, when you're 23, uh, when you're 20, 33, you still need to go back, but you're not going back to college. You're going back to something else. So learning is no longer an event because it's going to happen every three to four years. 
and speaking of uh, upgrade i'm really curious to know like how was the idea conceptualized like what did you see as the need um and how was this idea i think the need was pretty much what i summarized that you know we have 100 million people in the workforce and not everyone is 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 relevant and up to date to what they want to do uh in this decade of 2020 to 2030 one out of every five working professionals in the world is going to be an indian okay and if you talk to anyone from an it company to a banking company today most people will say i'm hiring people but they're not job ready what do they mean by that they've got degrees but they haven't got the soft skills and without those soft skills you can't get there you really can't do it if you don't have the interview skills you don't have the confidence skills you're not going to speak to speak up at a meeting you don't have the clarity of thought you don't have that you're not going to be able to excel in your job and therefore you're going to plateau and that's important for us to change so that's really the problem we're solving okay and given your vantage point right as the chairman of an edtech firm like what what are the ch- what are some of the challenges that you face well i think for an edtech company today the big challenges are acceptability and now in the last 5 months there's been more acceptability because everyone has realized there's no choice but acceptability was a, is a big one credibility is a big one the fact that everyone looks at online and says no that's very casual but actually there's without without tech platform and our learning experience we've been able to build that uh and credibility with parents and spouses because they want to know what the hell are you sitting in front of a computer at 11 pm in the night and doing for 2 hours what are you watching what are you studying what are you doing i do can't believe you could be studying that because nobody's ever done that before you go to employers and corporates they saying yes but i'd much rather you go to a physical university and come to me because it's tried and tested so which hr manager or ceo or founder of a company wants to take a risk on that colleges and universities have spent so much time effort and money to build the physical institution and the faculties are so used to the proximity of live interaction that they can't see a vision they can't see a life outside of that but the impact that a really good professor can have if he can have that lecture instead of talking to 30 kids to now talk to 3000 kids is incredible and today in swadesh in the last 5 months outside of a reverse migration problem we've started a whole project called digital swadesh you know where we are now running agriculture classes we're running everything else on digital we want everyone to have acceptability of digital we're holding the hands but i think in 2 years time 60% or 70% of our work in rural india we will do digitally okay the two questions that come to my mind the first one is um you spoke about how the last 5 months has kind of you know paved that way also in getting more people con- to look at online learning and consider it um but let's just imagine like say few months from now a post covid situation i just want to understand do you see the tech role of technology in education would continue to have the same kind yes, of moment yes yes i think so i think that i th- i think that people who yes i think people who moved away from college and whatever else they will because they've understood that there is an essential people are going to find that the world and the job opportunities are contracting so it's very important that you come into the top 50% of your of your workforce and how are you going to do that you have to get into specialization you have to have ongoing learning otherwise it's not going to happen so i think what has happened is a sense of urgency and a certain relevance and credibility has come into that that won't get reversed and what about its impact on traditional learning systems like i understand what you're saying it's supposed it should be positive it's not an either or it's not going to displace anything yeah. but you know i think that's how people should view it that it is going to be an either or and it's going to be an augmentation yeah the best of fact how much even if he's if we have to get 30 million people into higher education right now we don't have universities to do that that's a 100 billion dollars that we would have to do that's you know like 5% of our gdp would have to be spent on just setting up college campuses and it'll take 10 years and will we have the faculty to feed those universities not at all but in online the best of faculties 30% of our lectures are taken by faculty 70% of our lectures are taken by industry professionals because when i'm teaching a marketing class or a whatever class i'm teaching the person who's done work for 10 years and giving that is a lot more credibility now we just have to see to it that he explains it in a simple enough manner I teach for India. I would love to be part of it, but I don't know whether I can commit myself to do that every Saturday. But if you told me to do it digitally, hey, I'll be more inclined to participate. So for anyone and everyone, the ability to scale is going to be huge. And that makes sense. Uh, the second question I had is: uh, you were talking about digital Swadesh, right? Uh, and the skeptic in me is wondering: like, do we actually have the resources that's required 
to ride this wave, especially in rural India. And just want to get your thoughts on how can we ensure the technological gap between rural and urban India. And uh, we seeing we are seeing this play an, uh, a major role in the way our students learn and how much time it's taking for us to you know even bridge the gap. Uh, yeah. Whether you have access to digital devices yeah. or not. Just give your thoughts on that. Yeah, so I, look, I'll give you an example. My daughter runs her own not-for-profit called the Lighthouse Project, okay, uh, which is a mentor-mentee program. She's got about 700 mentors and 700 mentees, and she, you know, Lighthouse works with uh, TFI also, where, the, where some of the kids are there and they mentor them. Uh, and it was all physical, right? They used to do physical classes, then they would go out to the schools and send Saturday afternoons with them, etc. And over the last five months, it's gone 100% digital. Can we afford that our mentors have not spoken to the mentees for five months because no, there's no physical touch. You're not going to be able to go and start meeting them. They've automatically gone there and there's been no technological lift. And those kids there on the other side from your schools and many other schools have accepted that very, they want to stay in touch. They found necessity is the mother of invention and they found it. Digital has happened there. So I think it's not about the resources. The resources are three things, you know, whether you have a smartphone, whether there's wireless and what's the content. And I think we can solve for all those three. Will it be a, you know, will it be a, a sweeping change? No, but I think once you get the younger generation involved with that, the older generation will peep, then they'll be nosy. What are you doing? And then they'll accept it. Okay, thanks for sharing that. I'm actually going to take some of the questions from our participants there. Sure. I'm not sure if you can see the Q&A section, Ronnie, but uh, there's a whole set of questions. Some of them are quite interesting. Sure, uh, I'll start it. with this one. Uh, it's a, uh, the question is, you work in so many sectors. Which one is your favorite and why? No, there are no favorites. In this. Uh, a favorite could be in the time of the day favorite. Favorite could be um, the bigger the problem, the, the more the favorite at that time, because then the challenge to solve it is quite incredible. But actually, you know, the good part also is that yeah, I've, just, I've just been very fortunate that, I've, that I have a lot of fabulous people that work with me in everything that we're doing and therefore the team works a lot. Um, and that allows me to therefore be in multiple places multiple times from that perspective. But I wouldn't say anything that's favorite. I mean, how can I not say that what we're doing in Swadesh and creating an impact is, is, should be my favorite. But how can I not say that every, you know, every graduation ceremony, we had a graduation ceremony of 2,900 working professionals just last Sunday for a data science course. Now, 2,900 students graduating, the, the Dean of IIIT Bangalore wrote to me after that and said, we've graduated today more students than we graduated in the last 21 years. So shouldn't that be a favorite of mine? And yeah, if I see the success of Uri and the fact that so many more people and the Army General writes to us and says, thanks for the movie, a lot more people now want to join the armed forces. Well, that's a proud moment. And if I can win the Kabaddi tournament, it's a proud moment. So I think it varies. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, it's really interesting. You did mention about having a team uh, and one of the questions, like how they allow you to, you know, do these diverse things. One of the questions that's coming, what do you look for in people when you build your team? I would say broadly, it would be attitude and an ability to solve problems. Because if you're a problem solver, that means you're a thinker, you're a good planner, you also have good discipline, and most important, you're a very good listener. Because if you're not learning, you're not really solving problems. So I think attitude is very important. Attitude can solve many deficiencies. If you have the right positive attitude and commitment to that, you can solve a lot of deficiencies. If you have a bad attitude, you can be super smart, but you're not going to go very far. Uh, you'll create a lot of noise and there'll be a lot of perception, but finally you'll be called out as not that. So I would say for me, attitude and problem solving are the two things I would look for. Okay. Thanks for sharing that. And are there anybody whom you looked up to, uh, you know, as you were growing up, like who's your inspiration? I wish, I wish I was, and I'm not being sort of snobbish about that, but I think we all lack role models. On the flip side, you know, for me, mentorship is not about looking up to somebody. For me, mentorship has been really when people have asked me the toughest questions that I didn't have answers for. And I felt, shit, why didn't I think of that? Why somebody asked me the question for which I don't have an answer? That's been my best value add. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. Um, 
I know you had mentioned about this uh, in terms of, you know, attitude is something you're really looking at. Uh, but one of the questions that's come from Vignesh is if you had to choose your top three extremely relevant skills, which are, you know, sector agnostic, what would those be? Uh, I, I would still go with that. I would think problem solving and attitude is very, very important. And I think the third one would be a sense of discipline because discipline is with that comes mutual respect. Um, it's just when you have the right discipline, then everyone else gathers around you. So I think the only fourth thing I would add to that is your ability to inspire because people come to work for people, not for companies. Um, and they stay and learn and grow with people, not with companies. So I would say attitude is the ability to inspire, you know, and, and you need to be a great communicator. You need to have a lot of self-confidence to inspire, you know? So I think that's also very important. It's very interesting. Uh, like people, you know, grow and stay with people and not with companies. Yes. Uh, that's yes. I mean, I'm, isn't, isn't that something we all think about? I mean, we take yeah. it for granted, but actually, yeah, I mean, sure. Google has a great brand name and it's lovely for me to have a visiting card. But if the three people I'm working with who are my seniors um, are I'm just saying dickheads or maybe they're not dickheads because everyone at Google is supposed to be super smart, but they if, you're not, if I'm not learning from them, how long can I just hang on to that visiting card and the pleasure that, oh, I work with Google, but I'm not learning anything? Yeah, um, Ronnie, I know you had mentioned about uh, your team uh, and saying how they play an important role. But one of the questions we have here from Divya is, are there any personal practices uh, or how do you manage to juggle so many different things? Yeah, of course, definitely the team is helping you do it. Uh, but at a personal level, are there practices that you kind of follow and uh, stay? Yeah, I think there is a discipline. I think there is a discipline. There is a prioritization. I think the last five months of work from home has taught me uh, a strong lesson of less for more. And what do I mean by that is whatever I want to do, let's count the things that have the maximum impact and take away a lot of the rubbish in between. Otherwise, we kind of, the day gets full with a lot of stuff. So I think the less for more part for me is being a very important one. And I think a discipline of prioritization and focus uh, of what I want to get achieved. But if you really want to do that, the level of pre-planning you need to do, whether it's that half an hour or 45 minutes silent time in the morning on my walk um, or the half an hour of yoga that I do after that, that just helps me put the perspective of what I want to get through the day and prioritize helps. And don't forget, whatever your best laid plans, because you're working with so many people and multiple things, at least 30% there'll be energy suckers. People will come to suck your energy. Okay, because they've got a problem, they want to get it solved. So whether you like it or not, how do you build your own reservoir of positive energy? Because people are going to come to suck your energy and not in a negative way. Somebody's coming to you with a problem, somebody's coming with a grievance, somebody's coming with that, you have to solve it. But I got to replenish that energy and get back into place and yet finish what I set out to do in the day. It's interesting you're uh, speaking, mentioning about balancing energies. Recently, I'd also read an article saying, you know, why it's important to balance energy and not your productivity um, and, uh, and kind of resonate with everything there, what you shared. Uh, the, one more question which we have, Ronnie, is what tips will you give to a person who feels saturated to an extent, like who's really worked hard, but is not being able to see that success playing out? Like how does one, you know, kind of persevere through that? Well, how do you measure success? What did you set out to do as your success? If you persevered, either you're making some unreasonable expectations on yourself or you're doing it because you're trying to impress your parents, your spouse, your this, your that, your daughter, your friend, your peer, your husband, your wife, whoever. So I can't believe you have to be your best critique in that. So you can't live your life saying I'm not succeeding. Um, and what do you mean by success? Is promotion and only success? Is the highest salary and only success? Um, I think you need to do 10 days of Vipassana and figure out what is success for you. Thanks for that. I hope it helps. Uh, the person is if not, at least, you know, Anapana, if not the whole 10 days, of, <laughs> do, do 15 minutes of Anapana. And I think in 15 days, you should be having an answer on... Um, what is what is uh, what is success for yourself? Not what is success because there's no Oxford Dictionary context to that. Success yeah. is your own success, your own benchmark. Okay, yeah. So thanks for sharing that. It's, I think it's a very important reminder for all of us. 
Uh, I'm going to request you to, you know, share two messages here. Again, it's coming from the participants. So the first one is, what is your message to children or students of India as we are, you know, coming to the 74th Independence Day? Like, what do you hope for them? Well, my message is quite different from what I hope for them. So I'll first start with the message because yeah. I think that's very different from what I would hope for them. But the message really is, um, it is a complex world out there. Um, the peer pressure is something from your parents and whatever else do things. And it's a very young age. You're trying to impress people. Take the stress a little bit lower. I take the real bit of the stress lower. And I think we need to, we need to learn about real life and not just about the degrees. So how, how, and I, I, you know, when you're young, nobody's going to be able to advise you on that, but really the best lessons are the ones are the ones that where you grow up. I mean, I'm saying if I was in a school, I would have a head boy and I was nobody in college. No, I was not a team captain. I was not a this captain or nothing. Okay. That should not make me feel that I'm nobody. And just because I'm a head boy doesn't mean I'm everybody. So I think for, for everyone here, let's be a little bit more pragmatic about real life. I think we, we, we kind of spend too much time being connected to the obsession of degree, class, ratings, curriculum, all important stuff. Don't get me wrong. And we drop out on the soft skills of life. And I think my, I'm, a so, I'm a product of soft skills. I'm not a product of a degree. I'm not a product of deep learning. I'm not a product of formal learning. I'm a product of soft skills. I figured out in my early stage, serendipity, half anything else, that communication skills and self con my communication skills were good. That built my self-confidence, that built my self-conviction, that gave me the sense and the confidence to do more, and that cycle happened. How, why did I do that? I don't know. I started, I didn't go boxing and uh, being an athletic. I just did dramatics, elocution, and debate in school. Okay, that gave me the sense of being ability to communicate. That community communication gave me the sense to do drama for, for, a, for a, an act on stage, which gave me a further sense of confidence. A thousand people watching you, if you slip up, nine other people are going to let down on stage. And yet, and people will start laughing at you rather than with you. So I think this is very important for all of us today and forever. Thanks. And anything about the hope for students? Yeah, and I just hope that all of us who actually can make a difference to them understand this more because I think they need it, but they don't know it. We know they need it, but we are so trapped in the element of what we need to do with them by convention that we don't think nonlinear. So I think the hope is, I hope that the people who are helping them start thinking nonlinear, which means that yesterday what you did may not be as relevant as what you need to do today and tomorrow, number one. And for everyone in the not-for-profit space or almost anywhere else, I would ask, what is the risk you took yesterday? What is the risk you took? Not a life and death risk, not a risk which is like you're going to be bankrupt or whatever else, but just some risk. Because when you push yourself to take some risk, you experiment. You have an open mind. And this is the second message, Ronnie. Like, what is the message you have for teachers? Um, as we, uh, I think it's a similar message because it's yeah. a very, it's it's a very conjunctive e ecosystem, right? So I mean, I, well, I'm speaking as a grown up for the kids. I can see it through their eyes, but I see it as what all of us can do. So I think it's pretty much that same message because each is completing the other into a circle. The teacher and the teacher. I don't mean teacher in any formal sense. The teacher that we do, the teacher that teaching that you do, the augmentation teaching that you all do, the, whatever, you know, it's the, it's the after school as much as the within school that makes a difference. Let's take sports today. Why are we a nation that can never win an Olympic award? Because I think in some ways we spoil our kids, that element of discipline. We don't think it's a career option. We think sports is like, oh God, Anywhere else and anywhere else, that drill is, you can't be a real Olympic champion if you haven't started at the age of 8, 9, 10. Now, who's going to tell that child that there? The parent who's insecure that, no, no, I can't let him take a sports career because that means he may never have a job. No, let him go to the government service. So we're all accountable in some way. Yeah, no, that makes complete sense. Um, I, people are really interested to know like how, how, your, how your day is uh, given the lockdown, I'm sure you're also working from home. Uh, 
I'm uh, working from home. I'm yeah, from so home. they want to know what do you, when you wake up, how do you prepare your day? How do you decide what you have to do? Like what constitutes an uh, average day for Rani? I mean, there is my, my own time, which is very important. I think from about 6 to 8.30 is really my own time. It's the most productive hours of the day for me because it's not only my own time, it's my best thinking time. And most important for me, my pre-planning time. Not just for the day, but for anything else. Because after that, as I said, you're in a little bit of a, everyone's there to suck your energy kind of a role. Um, but I think the element of a little bit of your own personal time some set of goals that you want to get some things done that day, that week, that month is very, very important. And then reviewing that over a period of time. And yet, are you spending enough time for introspection and learning? Introspection and learning. If at my present age, I'm restarting all over again, I want to roll up my sleeves. And most people ask me, but now you've been there, you've done that. Why do you want to start all over again as a startup? Roll up your sleeves. Start from the first employee. Do whatever you want to do. Yeah, because otherwise I'll stop learning. Yeah, that appetite for learning is quite inspiring, Ronnie. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I'll come to the last question from my side, right? Um, most of the participants here are fellows who are working as full-time teachers. Post the fellowship, they'll probably go and start their own enterprises. Uh, and this year, teaching has also been completely very different. Like fellows are working really hard to conduct online classes, remote classes, find out what the kids need. Teach for India as an organization, we moved into even providing essential, essential basic amenities to some of our student families as well. What's the advice you have uh, as this 2020 cohort particularly? Like they're getting done with their institute in two weeks and they're going to enter the city and really you know, take complete charge of the fellowship. What advice would you give them? I would say a couple of things without being repetitive of, we need to take some risks. Even in education, it's not about a sandbox. I know that I think the training that we've got is let's follow this. And there is SOP and there is process. And please follow that because it is a serious business. You're impacting people's lives. But because you're impacting people's lives, there needs to be also a personal connect. When I say storytelling, you can teach this way, you can teach that way. But the memorable parts that will seed with people is the right mix between some of the soft skills and the ability to take that human touch which I think is what you'll actually do. I mean, Teach for India is very different from anyone else because you do have that. There's a high level of empathy in the way you'll approach whatever you do, which is fantastic. So how do we put that into practice would be one. And let's think about India as a problem with, uh, India is a country with so many problems that we have to solve problems at scale. You know, everyone said, oh, why don't we do a dream village in, in our rural India? And my point was, yeah, but, I can always do one or two vill dream villages. I mean, that's no big deal. I can actually go and physically paint each and make a uh, path and make it sound like, wow. But to make 2,200 dream villages then requires a model. So how are we going to be able to think a little bit bigger, take a little bit of more risk, look outside a little bit of our sandbox, but broadly raise aspiration levels. That would be my last message. I think in India, our aspiration levels, our ambition levels are not as high as they should be. I know we think we're an entrepreneurial country, but we're nowhere near there. Okay. Yes, you read a few of the good success stories. That doesn't mean we're an entrepreneurial country because we're 1.3 billion people. We should have had 10 million entrepreneurs, not 600,000 entrepreneurs or 60,000 entrepreneurs. So we've got to be able to raise aspiration levels. Where we're working with us for this foundation, for me, one of the biggest challenges, aspiration levels. I want to see how somebody who's earning 50,000 rupees a year as a family household income can get to two lakhs. But I want to see it more than he does because he or she has not understood what four times the money in my pocket will do for me because they've not understood financial inclusion. Because of that, they're not aspiring. Now when my reverse migrants are going back, those people have come to Bombay. They've been more competitive in their learning. They've been kicked around in life. They've got higher aspiration levels because they came to the city. If I can transpose some of those aspiration levels to rural India, it'll be a big thing. So I think teaching ambition and aspiration levels and raising them at that very young and influenceable age can be phenomenal. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, I'm going to request all our participants to go to the chat window. Just quickly share your one or two takeaways, learnings from this conversation. Um, and as we see those responses come in, Ronnie, 
a couple of people have asked how can they be you know part of your team and join your work at swadesh foundation after the fellowship so maybe you can but i think but simple share. way i can just say is right now if you can write into www.swadeshfoundation.org but i have to caution you that the kind of work we're doing is so deep that we can for us we don't know how to handle volunteering by itself because you can't come in and go out but we what we have done very well and one could be a good starting point is like it was my dream that every mumbai school adopts three of our schools in rural maharashtra and actually the aditya birla uh, school has done that and they and there are 40 of those kids that come for 3 days every year and they are tracing the growth of those kids they sit down and talk to them about mathematics about this but they're raising aspiration levels with those kids in a very lovely way and talking about what do you want to do when you grow up questions because i said in career counseling we don't have that so um that's what i would say as the, as the key part thanks for sharing that uh, the chat window has a lot of uh, uh, comments from our participants on what they are taking away just the ones around how you raise your aspirational value they found it also to be really real and practical uh, what you've spoken about the importance of problem solving attitude the balance of energy so a lot of things which you've shared is really resonated uh, that's lovely i'm so glad i'm so glad definitely given us food for thought for this weekend as well um any closing thoughts from your side on how this experience has been how the space has been for you no i think you're doing an incredible job just do it from the heart because that's what's most important do it because you really enjoy it that then you don't need motivation from anyone because when you really enjoy it and you love what you do you just do it you'll do it 3x better than anybody else in your own manner and keep learning yeah thank you thanks I'll, a lot thank yeah, you yeah i'll end it with that note of just keep learning i think it pretty much captures the spirit of you know what's happening in upgrad and at teach for india just wanted to say a huge thank you to you for taking the time being patient with us with the starting as well no no so no don't worry about sorry that about that fine. inconvenience Not i'm fine. glad we could have this conversation we've also recorded it uh, and uh, we'll also share it on our facebook page as well and uh, we've uh, tagged the swadesh foundation we've discussed this as yeah. well um, but just wanted to let you know but thanks so much for giving us your time and thank you so thank you very us. much yeah bye everyone thank you bye bye